All right, we are live. I'm here with Dr. Kip Davis and Dr. James McGrath, and we're here to discuss <laughs> Richard Carrier, of all things. Uh, how does hey. it feel that both of you have been called incompetent by Richard Carrier? I'm told I should wear it like a badge of honor. <laughs> One of my blog readers gave me a supercut of how you know they did yeah. this for me. I posted it on my blog, but you know, they sent it to me okay. and, I, and I asked for permission to share it. They just basically made a, a compilation of the insults that he lobs at anyone, you know, and uh, I actually used that in know. one of my videos. Yeah, I mean the, the nicest thing he ever says about someone is that they just haven't read his work, right? You know, it's like if they disagree with him. Um, so but you can't you be competent read and read his work and disagree, have apparently. That's going to be the Sorry. first question I ask. Have you read his work? I have. Uh, do you want me to put? Uh, I, I'm pretty sure that if I put my hand on a Bible and swore, I mean, <laughs> although that would show my that wouldn't uh, count, would it? New Testament literacy, right? Uh, if I was willing to do that, but um, yeah, I'm also not sure it would carry any weight with him anyway. But um, yeah, and I've never been a Boy Scout. Otherwise, I could do like Scout's Honor. I will do it with the Vulcan salute. People who know me will know that that's like that's about as high of a you know, a, you know. A high endorsement. Recently, that you and I are Christian apologists, so we're here to uh, try to get Kip in the fold. <laughs> I so not this time, but I have I I have surprisingly also been been called uh, a Christian apologist, and only by oh, only on the basis of my my opinion on this issue, um, which I I guess tracks. So uh, I guess I should I should point out that I have only read. Um, Richard's work selectively, so not comprehensively. Um, but I do feel like I, I have I have seen certainly enough um, propagated on his on his blog and in in interviews and talks that he's he's also done on uh, on YouTube <laughs> to uh, to have a good strong sense of uh of where the where the arguments within the book are those that uh you that, actually that have I haven't read directly you have a series on a few is it one chapter of his book yeah uh and it's not even the whole chapter because he uh it's it's only the uh, my my uh three video series is tackling uh basically just richard carrier's handling of early jewish literature that he cites as background information uh, to forward his his theory on uh, the the minimal Jesus myth theory, um, and that amounts to I I think it's I think it's actually only like seven or eight of his it's like fifty elements of background information in in chapters four and five. So I just I just uh, uh, tackled those those uh, those few little bits, um, but uh, yeah, apparently. Uh, I I exhibited enough of a, a a clear misunderstanding of my own field um, that it 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 doesn't count. So what are you going to do? <laughs> that seems to be what we're going to be talking about today. It seems like a lot of scholars evidently are just not checking their claims that they're making. So uh, you've both had a chance to see this blog. What are your initial thoughts on on what he argues in this blog? Well, just to follow you know, Kip's testimony about his um, engage, prior engagement, uh, I spent a lot of time engaging with this subject. You know, I found you know, what's interesting is I thought Carrier was insightful and persuasive uh, back when he was a his historicist, right? Um, you know, he raised some interesting points about you know the resurrection narratives, how they might come have come about, you know, from a purely mm -hmm. secular perspective, and it. I thought it was fascinating and bizarre that he then went and said, you know, oh, well, actually, you know, all that needs to be tossed out because now I'm going to say that, you know, there was no historical Jesus who is a kind of a linchpin in this process of then the, you know, what happens with the tomb and everything else. So, uh, but I've been blogging about this subject for quite a long time. Long time. Uh, I will confess that I, I got bored, not of, uh, reading, I mean, I did get bored of reading it too, but of blogging about Earl Doherty's um, huge tome. Uh, but I did write a, a review of Proving History and then wrote three review articles for Bible interpretation uh, about on the historicity of Jesus. And so 
it's, you know, it's, you know, I, I am very much of the view that mythicism doesn't take evidence and arguments uh, seriously and deal with them fairly. And this seems like a good example, right? It's like, okay, I have one blog post and three articles for this online you know, periodical. And you can judge for yourself whether this evidence suggests that I have read these books or not. Yeah. Um, do I disagree with them? Yes. Do I, do I come to this hoping to disagree with them? I would emphasize no, right? I mean, if I could make a strong case for this, right? A mythical Jesus is no harder for someone to reconcile with some version of the Christian faith than a Jesus who expected the end of the world within the lifetime of his hearers and was wrong about it, right? You know, so it's not as though, you know, conclusions that I have are really conducive to Christian faith, whereas going in this direction, that would be, you know, somehow, you know, a step too far. And I, if I could make that persuasive case, mm -hmm. I would, I would probably, I, I think I could probably get a six figure book deal, right? And, uh, you know, go and make some more money from the book tours and all the other things, the interviews and the, and apparently I'm passing all that up, but as somebody who is, you know, if I'm, maybe I'm just incompetent as a moneymaker as well as <laughs> incompetent in my field, you know, it's one, it is a possible explanation. I'm not sure it's the most persuasive one. So I did want to comment on that real quick because he focuses this blog on this second group that he talks about of scholars who don't check their sources apparently, but he also references in the introduction that a lot of scholars that are Christians affirm the historicity of Jesus simply because they're Christians and, and seems to be like the insinuation is that you can't trust Christian scholars. And I've seen godless engineer, who's one of his disciples say this constantly, that you can't trust Christian scholars. They sign statements of faith and all this sorts, sorts of thing. But I, what I find interesting about that is you have Richard Carrier, who's this anti-theistic counter-apologist who argues against the Christian faith. And supposedly he's not biased, but these Christian scholars are biased and, and you can't trust them. And so uh, you mentioned this mythical Christ would, wouldn't shake your faith. And what I find interesting is you have progressive Christians that deny the bodily resurrection of Jesus. They deny the virgin birth. Why would why would it be a problem to go a step further and deny that Jesus was a historical person? You know what I mean? So I I, I don't understand yeah, like yeah. this yeah. the poisoning of the well of well they're Christians so you yeah. can't trust them. He he goes even a step further than that too. Uh, in what I've seen, you can't trust anyone uh, within the field because we've all been trained. Um, yeah. by by christian scholars as well even even jewish um scholars who who work uh in second temple judaism uh, uh roman antiquity and um and the new testament have apparently been been trained by christians and have had their their minds poisoned towards affirming this idea through nothing more than simple loyalty to the guild, which really is silly. And I, I think what it what it does, maybe as much as anything else, is it betrays uh, an astonishing lack of awareness and familiarity with with even how the guild works. Uh, you know, those of us those of us within it. I've often said, those of us within biblical scholarship often will look at things that that um, Carrier and other mythicists say and claim about the field of biblical scholarship and go oh, like that just looks nothing like my experience working with other scholars yeah i mean i think that that was one of the things that really jumped out at me in this particular blog post that you wanted us to talk about was that you know he provides this really wonderful example of the fact that he is either not capable of reasoning logically or is dishonest right he says that for somebody who is a person of faith to entertain the possibility that Jesus didn't exist, he said they must first admit their religion is false. And that's just bizarre, right? They must entertain the possibility. They must be open to the possibility that religion is false. You don't have to start by determining your religion is false. And only then can you accurately, you know. And, you know, he is, you know, I mean, it's no different with the ardent mythicist, right? Whose beliefs are reinforced by a community that affirms, you know, I mean, his genius is being affirmed by all of his fans, you know, and it's, it's hard to, uh, 
consider the possibility that one might be wrong in that, uh, you know, with that level of pandering that he receives. And so, yeah, you know, I mean, part it's part and parcel of scholarship for those of us who at least try to do it honestly and do it well, that we have to be open to the possibility that we're wrong. You know? And I'm, I, I do often think I'm right about things, right? I try to feel like I'm right about things and reassure myself that uh, I have some basis for my conclusions before I publish them. But yeah, you know, my whole life of encounter with scholarship from the very beginning has involved me realizing the things I thought I was wrong about. And at the very least building on and going beyond and tweaking things that I've thought. And you know, it's that's why we participate in the guild. It's not because any of us can reach all the right conclusions on our own because we're infallible, we are geniuses or whatever. It's because together, you know, we're all trying out new ideas and shooting down each other's ideas and critiquing each other's ideas. And collectively, this process is, is still fallible, but is more likely to get closer to the wow. truth than any one of us could working on our own. And so let me pull up the blog real quick. Share screen. So he says in the second paragraph, there is also, of course, the unfortunate public who believe there are mountains of evidence for a historical Jesus because they keep being told that. And I saw that and I'm thinking, who's telling them that? Who's who's saying that there are mountains of evidence for a historical Jesus? Well, I, I mean, I, I feel like this this is this, this is something that that does come out of a certain brand of, of Christian apologetics. Right. Um but I mean, if if you if you pay enough attention to to figures like uh, like like Josh McDowell or Lee Strobel or Jay Warner Wallace or, or or some of these characters who aren't scholars, then yes, you'll hear about these mountains of evidence. But when you delve into actual scholarship, I think I I think you know uh, scholars. Who, who work in the field will agree that uh, it's it, there the evidence for an historical Jesus is is not especially strong and it is really problematic and there's nothing we can do about that but well, he goes by the, say the, uh, the evidence is actually scant vague weak and problematic and I'm sitting here going amen <laughs> yeah right. I, I, the remarkable thing, though, is is that for who scholars um, have reconstructed Jesus to be, who who most scholars tend to uh, think this this person was this this apocalyptic uh, preacher out of uh, the northern hinterland of um, of Judah, it is pretty remarkable that we do have what we have um, concerning his 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 life. And his death. Um, I I was watching actually. There there was a there was a debate that I saw uh, fairly recently on this topic where uh, Richard uh, conceded, as he often does in public, the one in three chance that a Jesus existed, which in the past I had always considered as as just very low. On, on on the basis of of his uh, his mathematical model, and I started to rethink this in uh, in different terms, um, where for any other person from that from that social strata within within early Jewish culture, maybe those are actually fantastic odds. Uh, you know, what are the odds of the vast majority of of people who have existed that we know nothing about to have existed. Uh, you know, it's, a, it's impossible to quantify because the vast majority of people who have ever lived leave no mark uh, whatsoever on, uh, on recorded history. Yeah, I, I'd say basically just amen to that. That was a very good way of putting it. it we have relatively little, but more than any person who was first investigating whether there was an itinerant preacher that some people thought 
might be the Messiah, but who never minted coins or, you know, erected monuments. What do you expect to find, right? I mean, if you deal with ancient sources and ancient history, if you find that somebody, you know, it's like, you know, this is a letter, you know, that we have reason to think is authentic by somebody who met his brother. It's like, what more than that do you expect, right? That's better than we have for most ancient people. And yeah, when it comes to Carrier's model, right, his attempt to use Bayesian reasoning, I mean, in, in principle, you know, I have no problem. I thought, you know, it's an interesting idea. I actually hope people would discuss this, you know, so that we'd have both uh, people who are intimately familiar with this form of mathematical reasoning, as well as historians dealing with other areas, testing it out, trying it out so that you know, we'd have a, a sort of a robust response to this and say, yes, this, you know, this has some applicability or no, here's why it doesn't. But without that, you know, I can only talk about the argument as he makes it and the way he uses it. And he makes the, the lack of certain kinds of evidence, the, the things that we don't know, makes it all part of this one equation. And it seems to me that that's very problematic when applied to history in general and ancient history in particular. If we find a tombstone that says, here lies Fred, and it says nothing else, and we have no other information, if the tombstone is authentic, we're, we should conclude that it's probable that there was a Fred, right? Yeah. Then saying, well, but what are the priors, right? You know, what is the likelihood of something being named Fred versus something else? And what's the, you know, and people in this particular area, well, Fred was not the most common, you know, and you can, you can talk about prior probability and things like that, but historical evidence, it seems to me, doesn't work that way. As soon as we have evidence of some particular thing, a claim about, a saying about, a name of some individual, that's the evidence, that's the kind of evidence historians look for, that the individual existed, right? And so as soon as some detail that we have about Jesus is more probable than not, then the historicity of Jesus is more probable than not. And this is a misunderstanding that I often find where I encounter people who, you know, I immediately, you know, the, the prickle, you know, the, the skin starts get on edge, you start to worry because they say, oh, I'm a mythicist. But then they say, I'm a mythicist about most things. I think there probably was a guy, but I think most stuff, I'm like, that's, that's a mainstream historical conclusion, right? There are lots of historians who say, we know just a few things about this guy and not much else. And so I say, please, you know, stop aligning yourself with denialists who are trying to take the, those few things and say, well, as long as we've denied everything else, let's deny these too, right? Because why not? I mean, for a historian, the answer to why not is because the evidence seems to point in the other direction. You know, and that's the only reason. And it doesn't, yeah, it doesn't radically change things. You know, I, I'm not sure what you gain other than a loss of credibility by forcing the evidence that little bit further. Yeah. Uh, on the on the mathematics, um, I I will just say one thing. I I have uh, reasons to be suspicious about how useful this is when, on the one side, you can use Bayesian reasoning to demonstrate the non-existence of Jesus while also simultaneously being able to demonstrate that virtually everything written about him in the Gospels is stuff that actually happened. If you're using the same methods to demonstrate both, both points, um, to me, that suggests that there, there's possibly an issue with the model and with with the way in which the the mathematics are being employed and that on its own kind of makes me suspicious yeah well, what i'd say is that you know the bayesian reasoning you have to insert your estimate of probability and of course we we never say that you know based on the account of the crucifixion you know we we'd say it's a, a 72 percent chance as opposed to a 75 or a 70 percent chance that Jesus was historical because of this 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 consideration. Right. But the attempt to quantify is not necessarily a bad thing. But yeah, you know, what this shows is that, you know, as they say, garbage in, garbage out. And not necessarily garbage, right. but if you're confident, if you have reason to trust the material, then you're going to assign high probabilities. If you have reason to distrust, you're going to assign low probabilities. And so I, I often poke fun because of what 
William Lane Craig has done with uh, Bayesian reasoning and say that you know, using Bayesian reasoning, we can be absolutely you know, confident that there was no historical Jesus and that he rose from the dead. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Well, I'm too stupid to understand Bayes, so I'm going to switch gears here. <laughs> You're not alone. <laughs> he goes on to say Bart Ehrman, for example, is a hostile. He has repeatedly refused uh, to even read either of the two peer-reviewed studies, finding doubt the more credible posture. So he's, of course, talking about his book and Raphael Letaster's book. Uh, let me bring up – stop sharing that – so I actually asked Bart Ehrman this on his blog, and I got a reply. So we're going to pull this up. I'm excited to see this. Can you see it? Yeah. Yep. You might have to squint, but no. I will read it out loud. i got to find it first. So I, I asked yeah. him about this claim, and he said, yep, I've read Richard's. So I want to stop right there. So Richard claims that... Airman has repeatedly refused to read his book, but Airman goes on to say he can't believe I have I have read it because I don't find it in the least bit persuasive. And surely if I would have bothered to read it, I surely I would have if I bothered to read it. Right. And because I've steadfastly refused to engage with him because he has publicly mocked and demeaned me. And I don't think ridicule is a form of intellectual discourse. I said that before that I've read it, by the way. So I don't know why he keeps saying that. And then he goes on to say that he skimmed through with Taster's book, but he didn't find it convincing. So he hasn't made it a high priority. So one of the reasons I wanted to ask you up front, if you've read Carrier's work, is this is a common accusation that he makes that, oh, this scholar or that scholar, they haven't read my book. But, you know, Airman's saying here that, yeah, actually I have. And I don't know why he keeps saying that because I've made it clear that I have. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, you know, I mean, we live in this era when people go online, Google stuff, and say, I've done research, right? And ultimately, right, those of us who work in academia know that none of us, you know, is going to be an expert on everything, right? All of the possible uh, literature that, um, and historical questions and archaeological digs and uh, studies that might intersect with the things that each of us individually actually works on. And so we're dependent on other people, right? And we look to the consensus, not because it's foolproof, but because we are forced by virtue of our jobs to disagree with one another, right? The only way to get something in print is to try to say something new. And so we try out new ideas, we explore new possibilities. And most of those, especially when dealing with texts that have been studied for centuries, if not longer, most new ideas, there's a reasonable chance they're going to be incorrect, right? And so we rely on the consensus because when you put a bunch of people who have this drive, this impetus, this compulsion to say something different and to challenge consensuses, still nonetheless agree on something, it doesn't guarantee it's right, but it means that people with expertise find this more probable than not. And it's a good guide, right? And so we turn to that, each of us in other fields. That's just how it works. And ultimately, I mean, I think you have to look and say, is it the case, just as you would do with any other form of denialism, right? And I put mythicism firmly in that category. Whenever you have somebody who's rejecting mainstream uh, science, history, anything, medicine, anything else, I think you need to ask, is there this big conspiracy or everybody is incompetent in this you know, field or maybe just everybody in academia is incompetent? Or is it more likely that this individual who in any given blog post is saying things that you can see are problematic is not, an untrust, is not a trustworthy guide to, to this topic? And the fact that, you know, I mean, it could be that Bart Ehrman's lying and I'm lying and Kip's lying and all of us are lying. And you know, we, we wrote these things about his book without reading it just because, you know, Ultimately, when you have to you know, force things and you have, you know, it, it ceases to be believable. I don't know why, you know, why would you pile unbelievable thing on unbelievable thing, untrustworthy scholar on untrustworthy scholar, when it could just be that Richard Carrier is not the genius that he thinks he is, right? It's a much simpler, but, straightforward but James, explanation that I think fits the evidence. 
up up until only very recently though you know uh, uh scholarship was convinced that moses and the and the patriarchs uh didn't exist and and, and now here we are where where huge numbers of scholars will will concede these facts mythicism is just you know it's just it's just in that process of moving from from you know this this minimal uh minimalist fringe position into uh into a consensus uh and so i i hope i hope you everyone recognizes my tongue firmly planted in my cheek here uh because this is a this is a a, a notion that i see forwarded uh all the time by by those within the mythicist camp and i think uh quite often it's it's put out there um with not a real clear sense of the history behind the acceptance of these ideas. I did a whole stream on this about a month ago, um, maybe two months ago now, uh, where I, I went through what happened with, with uh, Tom Thompson and, and his, his excellent book on the historicity of the patriarchs. And, you know, importantly pointing out that simultaneous to, to while Thompson was writing, John Van Cedars was also, um, independently writing about the same sorts of things, how much of this was more of a critique of archeological method than uh, specifically making uh, uh, arguments about whether or not the patriarchs ac actually existed. Um, and Moses gets lumped into this too. And, and people, I think, when, when scholars certainly within, and, and I deal, this is more, this is more of my, uh, uh my wheelhouse here but when scholars talk about their great uncertainty about the historicity of the exodus or or this idea that moses was actually a, a a mythical figure of some sort i think people have a tendency to misunderstand what we mean by that so um there is there is wide support i mean there are certainly scholars who think that that virtually all of this stuff was just made up out of thin air but there is a wide swath within scholarship who will who will tell you that yes there was there was a guy who led a revolt of some sort uh out of Egypt which inspired these traditions and there's even some you know we even have some some spotty but uh legitimate textual data to support that theory. If you read Hosea chapter 12, you can see it in there. There is a there's a, a, a fragmentary, highly controversial text that came out of the uh the discoveries at uh at, at Kintulit Ayrud, um, which feature possibly an anonymous figure of this sort who led a slave revolt of some sort. Uh, you know, the the denial of the historicity of Moses is not the outright rejection of an historical figure. I I often feel like this is an important point that needs to be emphasized over and over again. Yeah, I mean, I think the only thing I'd add to that, you know, thank you so much, Kip, for put, putting it that way. Um, the only thing I'd add is that in the case of Moses, the patriarchs, you know, in addition to it being that we now lack the confidence that people once had uh, before investigating this for the most part, right? It's not as though right. scholarship was, you know, it's historical scholarship, right, is something that has existed in New Testament, Old Testament, you know, early Christianity, ancient Israel, any area since, you know, the Enlightenment, right, in the form in which we now talk about it, and has been in development since then, and it's taken a while for things to be investigated. If we had the kind of gap between our earliest accounts about a historical Jesus and when he was supposed to have lived, then the situation might end up, right, if it turned out to be analogous in other ways, be similar to that of the patriarchs. That is not the case, right? We have, you know, some have tried, you know, maybe I think because they have a sense that this is a problem for mythicism, have tried to, you know, make it so that Paul could be talking, even though he has this apocalyptic fervor about the imminent end, could be talking about somebody who lived who knows when, way back, but, you know. Yeah, it, it doesn't fit the evidence. We're dealing with a shorter amount of time in which someone who mentions this, 
Paul mentions that he had relatives who were in Christ, in other words, part of this Jesus movement before him, right? We have, you know, that's not eyewitness testimonies, though we know Paul actually saw Jesus. We don't know that he didn't, but you know, we don't have any reason to think that he did. But he has connections with people who were there from the beginning of this thing. And again, for somebody who is not the kind of person who would leave tangible evidence in the form of coins that they mint with their name on them, or monuments erected with their, you know, with their image or something like that, this is very good evidence. Can we say we're going to reject this kind of evidence? Sure. But what I'd love to see from mythicists is claiming uncertainty or even skepticism about everything in ancient history that is analogous or, or, or worse, right? Because you'd be able to say very, very little. And that's not the case, right? And that's why, you know, when people who are mythicists, you know, sort of proclaim their um, their status as skeptics, I'm like, it's, it's that classic selective skepticism, right? Applied to one person or one tradition or one question and not applied consistently across the board and certainly not turned back to examine some of their own assumptions and ways of argue, arguing. All right. So he goes on to say, one can only speculate on Bart Ehrman's reason, stubbornness, ego, peer pressure, uh, fearing a loss of financial success or social status, family issues, who knows? And I have a video on this called uh, an unemployed blogger talks about Bart's wife is the name of the video uh, where he talks about the, he speculates that the reason that Bart Ehrman kind of poo-poos on the evidence for mythicism is that his wife is a Christian. So I, I just don't understand why do you have to speculate on the motives of other scholars on why they affirm certain things? Have you seen any scholars behave like this in other areas? No. Uh, <laughs> no. no I, I mean, certainly, you know, I mean, I think that you know, the point that you made earlier, which I don't think I, either Kip or I touched on directly that people who work at institutions that are, you know, conservative religious institutions that have a statement of faith that people working there must sign, they're absolutely, it's appropriate. You know, scholars often you know, don't even pay that much attention to some of those figures, right? Some of them, you know, despite having, you know, a clear ax to grind, a clear bias, do work that's worthy of engagement. And we, we do so. But some of them were like, this person is not doing research and drawing conclusions. They are looking for arguments to support what they are required by their place of employment to. Right? And so it's not that it's implausible that somebody might either to keep their job or to you know, uh, you know be sensitive to what a spouse might find offensive, might refrain from arguing certain things. Once you have Bart Ehrman drawing the conclusions that he does, it seems to me that yeah, it doesn't seem to me, you know, if, if nothing that he's published thus far about the Bible uh, or about religion is uh, you know, going too far with his wife, then I think his wife is perfectly okay with the fact that, you know, they don't see eye to eye on things. Right. Uh, and some of us are honest and have, you know, lively, loving conversations with a spouse who disagrees with uh, and doesn't see things the same way, you know? Um, and if Richard Carrier has never had a close enough relationship with someone that he could disagree with and still remain friends with, that just seems to confirm what we've gotten to know about Richard Carrier, but it's not true of everyone in the world, right? And so you know, I, I think looking at those kinds of considerations is not inherently inappropriate, but once again, you know, we, we, we see that Bart Ehrman is being honest, he's being critical about things. If anything, I think sometimes, you know, he doesn't go, you know, far enough, you know, but that's true of lots of people, right? And uh, you don't need to appeal to a, a spouse's influence in order to uh, explain that. And, and it's it's yeah. astonishing that that he, he does not uh, even entertain, which to my way of thinking is absolutely on the face of it, the most likely reason in that Bart Ehrman is just not convinced. So I have, uh, I have ideas. I have published um, arguments. 
uh, about about things that not everyone agrees with. Um, for uh, just as an example, for uh, going on ten years now, I have become quite convinced of my interpretation of a a set of fragments uh, signed to a, a really interesting manuscript at at Qumran in the Dead Sea Scrolls, 4Q491. This is a, a possibly a, a, an early form of the War Scroll. I am absolutely convinced of my interpretation of this uh, and have worked very hard to convince one of my uh, mentors, uh, Marty Abeg, who has done extensive work in the War Scroll. I have, I have, have thrown it out there as best as I can, my argument, uh, and he continues to come back to me and say, I just, I, I just don't buy it. For 10 years, he's been telling me this. And it's not like I think he's, he's lying to me or turf protecting or that he's got some, some sort of ax to grind. I honestly believe that I just, there's something in there that he just does not find convincing. And that's, that's how this goes within scholarship. Yeah, I mean, it, it already at, in, at the stage of, you know, working on my doctorate, you know, there were some things that I became, you know, absolutely convinced of and, you know, made the case for them. And then I had the question, okay, so am I going to take this model that I've been applying and apply it in other places, even where I'm like, oh, you know, this might work and things like that. And I did so. And some of those may be convincing. You know, some of them certainly are convincing, but the onus is on me to persuade others through my arguments. And if I fail to do that, then the answer is to make better arguments. I might, you know, if, you know, certain individuals don't, you know, accept my arguments, think, yeah, well, they might just be, you know, too committed to this older view that they hold. But ultimately, the, the onus is still on me to persuade them, right? And if it turns out that there is a sea change later on, right, you know, as paradigm shifts often happen, right, one generation passes yeah. away and a new one views things differently, that could happen. But it's as problematic when mythicists say, well, you know, it's going to change. You just wait and see, right? That's like the, the anti-evolutionists who say, yeah, evolution is a theory in crisis. Just you wait. You know, all the, all the biologists are going to change their view. Take this changing the any chest, day now. Just keep waiting. Uh, you know, it's, it's never valid to say, well, because people have changed their mind in the past, therefore, you know, we should assume that this will be the consensus at some point, right? Doesn't always happen. So he goes on to say, he's talking about hostile critics, which he would include both of you in that group. Mm -hmm. uh, the only thing they manifestly share in common is the singular result. They have convinced themselves they don't need to check anything. So Kip, we mentioned that you have a series of videos mm. on that chapter in his book. Did you check anything? Yes. <laughs> uh, and and fairly carefully, I might add. Um, I, I went through, you know, extensively the footnotes that I, I checked virtually every secondary source that he cited that I had access to. I didn't have access to, ver to everything um, that he cites. And one of the things that I have noticed, and I've, I've pointed this out uh, publicly before too, is I, I don't think this is, uh, this is so much an issue with scholars failing to check or to, to uh, uh, confirm uh, their own ideas so much as I, I think many times uh, carriers tendency to read some of the, uh, the, the background literature on this, the secondary source work uh, can be poor or, or just, just outright misleading. Um, he, he continues to promote this, uh, this, this idea on the basis of, of something he read in a popular book written by Daniel Boyeron with regards to the, uh, the, the early Jewish background of the uh, suffering servant as a messianic figure in, uh, in, in pre-Christian uh, Judaism. Uh, and in my opinion, and in the opinion of, of a number of other people who have uh, confronted him on this point, he's, not, he's either not carefully enough reading what Boyeron is trying to say, which is more to do with the fact that 
we shouldn't be surprised that people came to apply texts like Isaiah 53 to the Christian movement. Uh, he, he's, he's not being careful enough in his evaluation of that to the point that he has a tendency to misrepresent uh, the position. Um, which is not, and it and it's still not uh, not even a, a widely held idea. I don't think on the basis of of, of my reading of the field, um, you know that uh, that there even was uh, a very strong promotion of of ideas like this with regards to texts like Isaiah fifty three. So uh, quite often, um, I am I am puzzled and I am skeptical of the way in which which uh, carrier will read the secondary literature um lots of times i've noticed as well he'll he'll um depend on what i would consider uh outdated information and this is not like so and this is this is part of the problem of of when you delve into a field that you don't know really well um which is why you know you'll you'll probably never see me write anything on uh the epistle of of uh philippians or or something of that nature because i really don't feel like as as much as i have had uh professional training in in new testament text in in my uh my 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 history i just really don't feel confident enough in my grasp of of all the literature and and all the nuances of what's going on to to promote or, or, or to promote my own ideas about that uh, in publication. So I, I've encountered a couple of instances, one in particular I'm thinking of, where Carrier and, and mythicists uh, depend on a, a, a published uh, translation of a certain uh, text from the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, 4Q541, uh, which was made before uh 2005 on the basis of poor photographs um and in more recent uh scholarship now i mean we now have have available to us these very high quality digital images of all the fragments i mean it's it's readily apparent that there are several places within this fragment that have been mistranscribed and as a result mistranslated um and they're they're significant enough to to affect the entire meaning of the entire text uh and this is the sort of stuff that hasn't been widely published to this point it probably should be um but it's the sort of thing that unless you're right within the guild and unless you know how to effectively use all the tools you're going to be putting yourself at a disadvantage and and that's where I, I feel like very often uh, Richard's work will fall short because he's already at a disadvantage in his inability to to read all the languages or to to carefully enough navigate uh, the literature. Um, I, I mean, I, I don't doubt he's he's doing his best, but it's it is it, it remains a problem. Anything to add to that, James? Yeah, I mean, I found I, the, the whole blog post was strange, although none of the, not in ways that were surprising, you know, for anybody who's um, read Think Carrier has written before. But, you know, he does this thing where he just fills, you know, extends his verbiage at great lengths. And yet you know, it, it's as though, I think, as with the, the attempt to bring in, you know, uh, Bayes' theorem and put numbers on things, I think it's the hope that the, the verbiage or the... the in, intimidation that some people feel when when they see math, you know, and symbolic logic and things, uh, will keep people from looking closely at the details, right? Which is ironic in a post that's about, you know, whether people are checking things, right? right? I mean, you know, uh, I mean, it's common in mythicism, just to use one example, um, I'm happy to look at as many of them as you care to, but you know, Paul doesn't claim that he knew nothing you know, got no information about Jesus from anywhere, right? I mean, the very fact that he says that, you know, he has relatives who were in Christ before him, that he persecuted this group, right? He may have had wrong information, right? Oftentimes we oppose a group yeah. that we have a, a, a negative, unfairly negative impression of, but he, he knows something, 
right? What he says emphatically is that his gospel, right? The message that he proclaims, the core of it, is not something that he depends on other apostles for, right? He also says emphatically, right, emphasizing his agreement with the others, right? In 1 Corinthians 15, 11, right? He says, whether that it's they or I that preach, this is what we preach, and this is what you believed, right? So this core of information, right? And I've sometimes said, you know, sort of, again, very tongue-in-cheek to mythicists, if you want to believe that Paul received divine revelation so that he, without consulting any other human being, you know, ended up believing and pre proclaiming the exact same things as they did, you're free to do that. As a historian, you cannot posit that kind of miracle, right? We have to go for a more natural explanation that Paul got information from other people. And some of the way he talks about meeting with James, with Peter, uh, as well as the hints that he had relatives and others that he uh, opposed and now no longer does so, suggests that there is a straightforward historical explanation that is compatible with what Paul actually says. Maybe, maybe at this, maybe this is a good, good uh, place to, to, to bring up um, a, a specific point, uh, which I feel uh, affects a lot of Carrier's work, uh, which is, which is quite troubling. And that's his idea of what this phrase even means that, that Paul will use quite frequently, according to the scriptures. And I, I feel like uh, Carrier and all, often mythicists will will see this phrase they have an idea in their head of what it means right at the outset just based on on their their uh straightforward reading of of the text just a plain reading of the text and that's not i it, that's just not good enough because it doesn't delve into a more specific understanding a very deeply culturally informed understanding of what Paul is most likely getting at when he talks about knowing things according to the scriptures. It's a, it's a phrase that is, is not unique to Paul. It's something that he's inherited. It occurs um, a, a couple of times, even in, in uh, uh, the old Testament uh, in particular in the, in the, the book of uh, Chronicles uh, the writer talks about about knowing things according to the law. Um, it's used with great frequency, uh, this particular phrase, as well as analogous phrases to it uh, within and, and throughout the Dead Sea Scrolls, which is really where we should be grounding ourselves in attempting to understand what Paul is trying, what he's getting at when he's using this phrase. Uh, significantly, when the people who wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls talk about knowing things from scripture. They're talking about the ways in which the Old Testament or, or their, their Hebrew scriptures uh, came to confirm for them the, the validity and the special meaning of things that actually happened. Stuff that they were going through. Uh, there's a series of, of uh, texts, uh, people like to call them commentaries, or Pesharim, uh, Peshers, on the, uh, the the text of the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, which go through this uh, uh, th this this formulaic uh, structure of of interpreting uh, text from the prophets, where they will cite a text from from the prophet Habakkuk, and then they'll provide a meaning to it, and they'll say this the interpretation of this text is this, or this scripture means this uh it's it's basically an expounding of this idea of it being according to the scriptures and over and over again throughout these texts you come to discover that they're not just sitting down and reading literature and coming up with with ideas uh within their head no it's very important to these people that they're applying what they're seeing in the text of scripture to the very real stuff that they're experiencing in their day-to-day -day life, stuff that's happening right now. It's almost a way of history writing. Like the, the, these people aren't writing historiography, um, you know, in the Greco-Roman sense that, that, that historiography exists, but they are absolutely uh, communicating 
information about their own history. And this is how they do it. So if this is how they are reading the scriptures, if this is what they mean when they talk about things happening according to the scriptures, then what does that mean for Paul? when he continually goes back and references texts from the Bible and says, this happened according to the scriptures. Yeah, I, I just add to that, that, you know, I mean, this connects with Carrier's whole thing about the uh, Rank Raglan, you know, um, mythotype and stuff of that sort. Uh, the claim that, you know, people are drawing on earlier sources, whether scriptural narratives or a general you know, archetype, and are then creating new characters and new stories from that, which you'll you'll actually hear people make the claim that this was just an ordinary thing. You know, people were doing this all the time, supposedly, you know, making new stories out of old ones, which it's like, uh, yeah, uh, there's definitely some misunderstanding of something that's uh, crept in there. But what strikes me, you know, particularly strongly, you know, as somebody who teaches about, you know, the Gospels, you know, and particularly, you know, when we get to the Gospel of Matthew that has you know, this was to fulfill what was written in the scriptures. I think mythicists, you know, very often are people who came out of some sort of conservative fundamentalist Christian background in which it was said, look at how precisely Jesus was predicted in these texts, right? There's all these predictions after predictions. And so all they've done is negate that and say, well, yeah, he, they still say he matches them, but it's because they were inventing a figure based on them. Whereas historical scholarship will show you, it's like you take, you know, Matthew's gospel, quoting, you know, Jesus and his family coming out of Egypt uh, to fulfill Hosea 11, you know, where it says, out of Egypt, I called my son. You go back and look at the original context. And it's when Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son, right? It's talking about the Exodus. It's clearly not a messianic prediction. It's not. And so there's typology going on. There's echoing of these things, but they're not predictions. And there's no sense in which Jesus is an exact fit to uh, these texts, right? Th there are probably some, you know, there certainly are some, you know, but that would be true of just about anyone, right? And so it's not saying something, you know, in some cases, it was stage managed, right? And you have the gospel author saying, you know, oh, we didn't realize at the time that we were um, putting him on a donkey and that that might be significant. It was, you know, we only realized afterwards, you know. And so, you know, this, this whole approach, you know, is based on a lack of detailed attention to what these texts say. So again, you know, claiming that there's this close match between Old Testament or Hebrew Bible or however one wants to put it, prophecy and other kinds of texts and Jesus here, too, I would say about mythicists, what Carrier is falsely saying about others, they haven't checked. Okay, so we've already gone 53 minutes, believe it or not. So <laughs> uh, we can't obviously go over every example, but let's go over mm -hmm. just a couple or a few. So the first one he lists is the argument from illiterate fishermen, and he describes it as the disciples can't have constructed this religion out of scripture they were illiterate fishermen. So can either of you steal, man, what he's trying to say there? Because I couldn't make heads or tails of what what of, he was saying that, that we were referring to. Of the statement there itself, this statement that disciples yeah. can't have constructed the religion out of scripture, they were illiterate because fishermen. He, he doesn't seem so. to, to mind naming names in this blog of, you know, this scholar says this, this scholar says that. He doesn't list the scholar here. So I I honestly couldn't make heads or tails of what he was exactly trying to say here and what scholars are saying this. Uh, I, I mean, I, I, I think, I, I think what he's, what he's getting at here is, is this idea that, I, and he, he talks quite, uh, quite positively about uh, Robin Faith Walsh's work in this regard, as well as uh, uh, Dennis McDonald. Uh, who have have uh, made a, a, a quite a convincing case on the uh, on on the uh, the nature of the gospels themselves as as higher forms of, of Greek literature than we at once uh, gave them credit for therefore um, and and it's sort of I, I think it's pushing back on this idea that, um, you know, Christianity emerged out of um, this this Galilean backwater, 
uh, among um, uh, a a an illiterate class of people. I, as as I understand, I think that's that's what he's pushing back on, which is a f- uh, uh, a semblance of uh, of some of the ways that I think the emergence of, of Christianity is portrayed. I'm I'm sure James can speak better to that than I can. Yeah, uh, it's, it's yeah. I, I stumbled a little bit because you asked to steal Manet, and I'm I really can't see how this. You know, I can understand the point. You know, and I think to the extent that there is a point there, it's it's not a bad one. That mm. there is a widespread perception that these were people who were absolute nobodies, uh, no education, or perhaps you know because. They would not have had specifically scribal training, right? Which was a very specific, you know, professional um, path. That therefore they were not capable composers of narrative or tellers of stories or poets or anything else, right? And so that is problematic, right? I mean, we yeah. to the extent that we have some of these people connected with the fishing trade, right? Mentions, you know, leaving their father behind with the hired workers. You get the sense that these are people who are involved in the fishing industry. It's not, you know, these are people who are, you know, just barely making ends meet and things like that, right? We have mentions of tax collectors. And, you know, so there's, you know, there may be a stereotype of, you know, the country bumpkin, you know, folks, right? Uh, it comes from the same lack of knowledge of context that thinks Nazareth was in the middle of nowhere. It was you know, certainly not a not a major hub, but it was walking distance in ancient terms and in some places today, modern uh, reckoning from what had until the lifetime of Jesus been the capital of Galilee, right? And so a major city. And so you know, it's a fair point, but I don't see that it in any way helps make the case for mythicism because people with literary ability, people who are capable of creating impressive narratives can do so about fictional characters or about real characters. They can do it about real characters in ways that reflect information that's widely known, or they can make up something that we might call historical fiction. And so their literary ability is you know, is ultimately a separate matter from the question of whether there was a historical Jesus. Yeah. So I want to jump in here a little bit. And uh, Jason Rollins said, uh, F- Robin Faith Walsh has for sure said they were illiterate fishermen, if you want to name. My point wasn't that scholars are saying this, that they're illiterate fishermen. My point was, usually when they bring up the illiteracy of the disciples, aren't they usually talking about whether the disciples could write? Because it seems to me, like in this blog, Carrier's talking about whether they could read. So he says, for example... It's not even credible they were fishermen. Paul never mentions it, nor First Clement or Hebrews or any defensible early texts. And then he goes on to say, Paul would have made hay out of the fact that all of made hay of the fact all over his epistles, because that would mean he alone and not they could read the scriptures, which he attests was absolutely essential to demonstrate oh. faith. Go on. Yeah, yeah. No. So this is this is one of these 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 places where I feel like like Car- Carrier has not carefully enough done his homework. Um, and I, and I checked after I, I read this, I went and looked in his book to see if he, if he has actually, uh, consulted any of the, of, of, you know, the, the far reaching, uh, literacy studies of the period, uh, Catherine Hetcher wrote a monumental book, uh, back in 2006, more recently, Mike Wise has written on this, I think in, in 2019. Um, so there's. There's a lot that he's taking for granted here in terms of, I I mean, there's several things going on. What does it mean to be literate versus illiterate within this, within this culture? Um, You know, you, people could read things and never have any uh, mechanical ability at all, or even uh, conceptual ability at all to actually write or compose literature. You know that's one of the disconnects, but I think uh, one of the things that uh, that gets missed here is just that for the vast majority of people, yes, uh, literacy rates uh, in the in the area at the period were very low in in terms of people's ability to actually read and actually write, but the the vast majority of people did not experience or learn 
scripture by reading it. People were sitting in synagogues and listening to others read these texts all the time. Uh, and, you know, this is, this is how people came to experience uh, this literature. So even if you couldn't read, that doesn't mean anything with regards to, to your ability or, or your effectiveness to, to take ideas that you've heard in the synagogue and texts that you know about without even necessarily having to be able to read them. You know they're there. And, and um, you know, using those to interpret your world around you. Uh, and then there's there's one other thing I want to I want to say here on this point as well, um, and and that is uh, this idea that somehow uh, Paul's uh, social status would have been guaranteed within the church on the basis of his ability to read, even if he was the only one who could do so, is silly. Um, and in fact, I think a, a strong case can be made that one of the reasons he does emphasize his commitment to what's written in the scriptures, a case could be made that, that the reason he does so as strenuously as, as he does is because this wasn't the great uh, flex that, uh, that he thought it was among the people in the Jerusalem church. Uh, one of the things that we do know is that there was not, certainly uh, in, in many segments of society, there was not a great stigma attached to one's inability to read. Yeah, um, so you're looking for us to strongman his arguments in uh, limited time, so maybe I'll suggest that I jump to John the Baptist. Um, I yeah, uh, Talk about... Uh, you know, trying not to miss anything, you know, and pay close attention to details. I spent the last academic year before this one, uh, had a full year sabbatical for the first time, and pretty much ate, slept, and thought about John the Baptist. And so, uh, <laughs> yeah. And he, here, you know, you can say there, there are some good points. You know, the, the baptism of Jesus by John is just a given for Mark, right? It's mentioned there. Um, it's clearly a problem for the developing trajectory. And so I think you know, the later Gospels do show us what the value of the so-called argument from embarrassment is. It's It shows that an individual is unlikely to be inventing something, right? And in the case of, you know, if, we ha if we didn't have Mark's Gospel, we would be fairly confident that Matthew and Luke and John, you know, we're not inventing this story about Jesus' baptism because each in their own way does something with it that reflects a certain amount of discomfort. And so... You know, in Mark, it's just a given. You know, the thing that's there throughout, right? And I mean, you can say the same thing about the um, the story that's often treated as though it's John the Baptist expressing doubt about Jesus. That's only an impression you get once that story is moved into the context of Matthew's gospel and or you read it through the lens of the gospel of John, where John the Baptist recognizes Jesus as the coming one from the outset. Right in the Gospel of Mark, that is not the case. Jesus is baptized. The overall tradition across the Gospels indicates to us that Jesus was part of John's movement. Right, was one of his disciples. And Jesus says, you know, you ask Christians, you know, who's the greatest person who ever lived? They'll be like Jesus. You know, it's like this Sunday school instinct. You know, there people are trained in. You ask Jesus, and he says, John the Baptist. You know, without question. Yeah, you know, among those born of women, you know, there's none greater. And so we have this apparent superiority of John, even in Jesus' own eyes, that the Christian tradition is nonetheless wrestling with. And so things like that are more to the point, I think, right? There is a role for John the Baptist, you know, in terms of his presence in the gospel tradition, saying something about the likelihood of there being a historical Jesus. It's not as though we get the impression that John is just some famous figure, which he was, and that they are inventing some other figure to sort of link him to John. They are seeking to grapple with, you know, why Jesus should first and foremost be the, the successor of John. And then as with, you know, also the point made about the crucifixion, why he should be 
viewed as the one about whom John spoke, who would come and enact judgment when he hasn't done that thing, right? And so Jesus' followers are saying, well, he will do it, right? He will come in glory and this will happen. And some of John's followers were clearly saying, yeah, right. You know, why should we believe that? And so it's the hints that we get of arguments that are happening, right? Places where the things that these authors are addressing are not that you wouldn't make up these problems and say, well, hypothetically, you know, so you know, this is, the, they are wrestling with objections that other people have, concerns that other people have. And this comes across clearly in the way that they write. Can we be 100% sure? Mm -hmm. No, but it's more likely than not, right? Because consistently we see people writing in this way when they are addressing claims, when they are trying to engage in, you know, polemics and apologetics and things like that. And so the argument from John the Baptist as worded, yeah, the, Carrier has some points, but the overall issue, the overall, overall concern about the relationship between John and Jesus has something. The point about the crucifixion, could there be crucified anointed ones? Yeah, lots of kings, you know, kings and high priests died. You know, that's, you know, if they're saying he's the descendant of David, who is the anointed one, they're saying he is the one who will restore the royal line of David to the throne. For that person to be crucified is a problem, right? This is not an abstract, you know, well, could he be a great person and be crucified? Sure. You know, that was not, that was never controversial. It's the specific claim that Christians were making combined with the crucifixion that it's like, if you're going to invent a Messiah, you're going to try and make some money by telling people you have this figure who fulfills prophecy and who is, you know, then you make them a success. You make them fulfill the prophecies and be a better match than they do. And it's clear that they're struggling to get Jesus and scriptures, Jesus and messianic expectations to match up. And the best explanation, the thing that's more probable than not, not is that there was a Jesus who didn't always live up to expectation, didn't always match what people were hoping for. And they are trying to do what they can with what they, what they have, what they've been given. He is a stumbling block to the Greeks, <laughs> or uh, to the Jews, and foolishness to the Greeks, right? Yeah. And I feel like that's 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 a hurdle that uh, that mythicism has a difficult, uh, some difficulty with with clearing, just because on the basis as I I I have read the theory it doesn't make any sense why this would be so objectionable to either one of those audiences if the theory is to be believed yeah so let's let's pay mythicism the favor that mythicism paid to us and say that you know, there's maybe a, a a one in three chance that they might be right but when it comes to ancient history we're looking for more probable than not and so it's still clear where you should go until such time as there's actually some new evidence or argument presented all right, and so what other examples did you guys want to look at? Um, let's see. There's the the Nazareth one. So I mean, I did I did want to say something about um, one of the things uh, in particular that that was brought to mind with with his his Nazareth uh, example. Um, you know, we we can see that this works. Uh, for the writer of the Gospel of Matthew. Um, the writer of the Gospel of Matthew is, is clearly attempting to make a connection between Jesus' origin in uh, Nazareth with, with something that appears in Scripture. We don't know what that is. There are good scholarly uh, suggestions about, about what, what, what that happens to be. I think it's a, a much more problematic case to make when it comes to the earliest gospel that we have, which is Mark. Um, because Mark throws it out there uh, and it, and it, and just kind of leaves it. And it doesn't, it doesn't really factor uh, into the construction of this figure in accordance with, with something that he's read from the Bible, at least not as far as, as I can tell. Yeah, um, I actually have a, a, a something I, I wrote. It was basically a conference paper uh, from SBL that um, I think is in our my institutional repository 
but it, it's called something like, you know, um, intertextuality without an intertext, uh, because Matthew says, you know, this fulfills a prophecy, but we're still looking and we haven't found it, you know. And that in itself suggests that there's something awkward here. And it is a fair point, right? So working on John the Baptist, but even before that, working on the translation of the Mendian Book of John, there is this term, right, Nasurai, that suggests that, you know, there there may have been a religious movement. There may have even been, it may have been John the Baptist movement that uh, had this term applied mm -hmm. to them. Um, that's only one of two words that we get in the Gospels. And it's entirely possible that just as if you talk to students today, sometimes they get confused about Nazarites versus Nazarenes, that there were there was confusion then, but already with with Mark and with these, you know, both Matthew and Luke in different ways, in contradictory ways, they're trying to figure out how Jesus, who needs to, according to their understanding of uh, the background of the Messiah and his birthplace, needs to be born in Bethlehem, uh, why he's Jesus of Nazareth, right? And they're dealing with it, having the sense that this is a place, right? And so clearly that's the impression that people have very early on. And if you're inventing someone, you don't need to go to this level of you know, exertion to rewrite the figure, right? Because you have a blank slate, right? Mark has has used this term, but you know, there are so many ways that you could uh, weave that together that are not as convoluted as what Matthew and Luke do. Right. And yeah, you know, they could have compared notes and found ways of you know not contradicting one another, presumably as well. And so, you know, ultimately, I think there are o definitely oversimplistic arguments from Nazareth. Right? And they're ones that don't even show awareness of the linguistic issue or the men, the Mendian use of a, a related term or anything like that. But ultimately, we still have very early on Christians trying to put Jesus in Bethlehem, his birthplace in Bethlehem, despite their sense that there's strong evidence that he was known as being from somewhere else. Yeah. Uh, I think maybe, um, as I read through this, this blog post too, uh, and he does touch on it at the end, but in my way of, th as I read through it, I, I kept thinking, yeah, but he's not really dealing with the elephant in the room here. I mean, he's, he's provided as, as, you know, scholarly objections to, or, or scholarly, um, um, endorsements of, of the idea of historicity of Jesus he's talked about. Nazareth, and he's talked about illiteracy of fishermen, and he's talked about uh, um, the crucifixion. But the ones that I think almost all scholars would tell you are easily the most compelling are the mention of, uh, of, of Paul's mention of meeting a brother of Jesus named James in the book of Galatians, his clear understanding that he was a human being in both the book of Romans and the book of Galatians, and just the entirely unconvincing ways in which Richard has attempted to dismiss these ideas. That's the, that's the main reason why scholars tend to, be, tend, tend to be more convinced that there was a guy than that all of this was just invented out of whole cloth. Anything to add to that, James? Uh, not, re not really. I, mean, I think it's, I'll just add that, you know, because there are attempts to say things like, you know, well, maybe there was a, a group, you know, of lead a leadership position called the Brothers of the Lord or something like that. It's like, okay, maybe, yeah, there's all, there can always be maybes, right? But you don't just say maybe and then treat that as though that's counter evidence to, you know, where the evidence used to point, right? And does uh, that, what's... like, does that even work, though, within Paul's, the way that Paul mentions, uses the term? It's so it's difficult yeah. to, to to make it make sense of what's actually going on yeah. in, uh, in the letters, because then is, is Peter not uh, a brother in the Lord? Or if everyone is a brother of the Lord, then why would, why would even bother calling James a brother yeah. of the Lord? in you know his meeting right. or if all the brothers of the lord are allowed to have wives accompanying them on their missionary journeys at, 
is Paul, so is Paul like the only Christian in all of Christendom who is not allowed to do, like there's so many, there's so many plot holes here that, that they become ridiculous to overcome. Yeah, I mean, when you can always find some way to try to force evidence to fit a framework, right, if you're determined to, but the initial suggestion that brothers of the Lord, brother, brother of the Lord, brothers of the Lord simply means the same thing as brothers in the Lord, right? Meaning Christians doesn't work because he's talking about Peter and James, the brother of the Lord, right? And so this is clearly a category that James fits into and Peter does not, right? Uh, the, the, you know, having a, a sister wife who accompanies you, again, it's Peter and the brothers of the Lord. So again, Peter is not in that category, which is why some of them have switched to saying, well, it's an elite status of some sort, some, you know, council of whatever, or, you know, some, you know, monastic order, you know, anything, you know, gr grasping at straws, things that we don't have any evidence for, right, in order to. Yeah. And what really strikes me, and this is, I think, particularly telling, is that I regularly encounter mythicists who will say, well, but look at Acts, right? It doesn't even mention, it doesn't mention that this is, you know, this James is the brother of Jesus. Like, okay, so the gospels, you know, the amount of time that passes between, you know, Paul and the gospels, you know, you can't read Paul in light of those things, even when they seem to agree, but you can bring what maybe the latest of our, you know, sort of accounts from the New Testament gospels, and say, well, look at what this says. That's evidence, right? Yeah. You know, so they just pick and choose. You know, it, the date doesn't matter as long as it says what they wanted to say, right? Whereas, right, the fact that this person may have written, you know, a few years, a decade after Paul, is a huge gap that you're not allowed to, you know, you're not allowed to find any commonality between the two because it's this intervention of time. It is so self-serving in terms of you know, what it does with the evidence, when dating does or does not matter, that mm -hmm. anyone who wants to describe themselves as a skeptic, as a critical thinker, should not, you know, should not take this seriously. Yeah. Okay, so let's look at one more example. Is there a specific one you guys want to look at, or can I pick one real quick? I I did want to, there was one more thing that I, I thought we should, we should, um, we should talk about here too, and that's, uh, that's, that's Richard's list of scholars. Um, oh, yeah. I know you also wanted to get to that. Do you want to do that? Do you want to do the other example first or, and save that for no, the no, end? Or, uh, so um, I, I think, I think he mentions it up, I, up close to the top. If you, um, so Richard continues to, to, to promote this, um, uh, this list of, I think he's up to 42 now uh, scholars that he's, he's curating who at least find, in his words, at least find the idea of mythicism plausible. And I, I checked it uh, again recently, and I, I wanted to make uh, a point of mentioning this because uh, quite often you did an excellent video um, response to uh, to a to a few of uh, of the scholars that are that are on his list. Um, he, the most recent one that he added, I, I think is, is really illustrative to why I get suspicious and, and have big questions about, uh, you know, whether or not we should take some of these things that Richard says, uh, very seriously. So uh, the most recent name on his list is, um, uh, who is it? It's, uh, um, Clint is Heacock. The, is that the, the podcast? Is? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the podcast, the podcast references. And I, I have it here. I can, um, I can, I can just read what, uh, what he says of, of Clint Heacock on his list of historians who take ser mythicism seriously. Uh, he reports that, uh, and this is a direct quote. On the Sensibly Speaking Con podcast, Clint Heacock uh, acknowledged Jesus might not have existed, cautioning if you accept that he was a historical figure and saying Jesus allegedly served his time on earth. And on the Graceful Atheist show, he admits there's a lot of questions around the Gospels and the historicity of Jesus. Now, like these are, this is quote mining, right? 
like it's it is just a classic case of taking snippet statements grossly out of context to make a point uh, that is contradictory to the point that um, that the speaker is saying. So I've I've transcribed these. We don't have to to bring these up, but I'll I'll just I'll just read you the transcription of what he Hecock actually said uh, in the context of, of using this statement. So um, he's talking about um, he, he's, he's talking about um, uh, women in ministry and uh, and much of uh, the resistance throughout church history to to women serving in, in positions of power within the church. And here's what he says. He says, most of the rest of the New Testament allegedly was written by the Apostle Paul. And that's where most Christians and most theologians get their actual theology from. It's from the writings of Paul. And that's where a lot of the patriarchal messages comes from. Because it's Paul who says things like, you know, wives submit to your husbands. I do not permit a woman to teach in church. She must be silent. She has to ask her husband at home. You know, women cannot be elders. Women cannot be leaders in the church. That is straight out of biblical patriarchy, and that's all from the writings of, the, of Paul. So they wouldn't cite Jesus, you know, and ironically Jesus, if you accept that he was a historical figure. He actually elevated many women, and they don't like those kinds of passages where, you know, he had women disciples. Apparently, he had women that, you know, supported him in his ministry and all the rest of it. So they don't like that idea that women could be on equal footing with men in terms of church leadership and all the rest of it. So does that actually sound like Clint Heacock is seriously entertaining the idea that Jesus might not have existed? Does it at all? Like it's... Yeah. It's ridiculous. Here's here's the here here's here's the next one. Uh so he's here he's talking about um uh he, he's talking about about the time gap between between when the gospels were written and when when Paul was writing his letters. He says there's many different layers because you have to understand that scholars accept the fact that the gospels were written much later than Paul's letters or his epistles to these various churches in Asia Minor and the Mediterranean world. The Gospels came much later. So when Paul was writing his letters to the churches, they didn't have the Gospels. There was no such thing. They were written after his writing. So really, the early Christian church adopted Pauline theology way before the Gospel because they didn't exist. So they were written decades after Jesus, you know, allegedly served his time on earth. So that's where Christian theology comes from. And then on the Graceful Atheist podcast, this is this is this is the last quote that uh, that that carry our minds. He says, "Okay, this fundamentalist conservative view of the Bible, and therefore the interpretations that are drawn from that view of the Bible, cannot possibly be consistent because the text doesn't support that. It really doesn't. Scholarship has shown definitively that is not the case." And there's a lot of questions around the Gospels and the historicity of Jesus, you know. So if you can argue about who Jesus was and what Jesus taught, and we need to recover the true Jesus, which Jesus is right, which Gospel, yes, you know, these are significant discrepancies. So, like, I think on every point there, he is just badly manipulating uh, statements being made by uh, by Clint Heacock to serve this notion that he's somehow endorsing uh, this idea that that serious questions should be raised with regards to whether or not Jesus was a real person. Yeah, uh, mythicists get really annoyed when I make comparisons between them and young Earth creationists and intelligent design proponents and folks like that. <laughs> but this is right out of that playbook, right? I mean, yeah, it is. just not not just in a general gen general terms, but I mean and not just the quote mining, but putting together a list, right? I mean, I don't know whether uh, most of your, you know, most of your viewers know the descent from Darwinism, Darwinism list, but 
the Discovery Institute tried to put together a list of people. And it was that same sort of hodgepodge where you had some people who actually had PhDs and positions in relevant fields, and then others who were scientists, but from other areas, things like that. And you'll notice that the uh, the the mythicist list includes, you know, people who do mostly Hebrew Bible, ancient Israel, do other things, you know, not you know, people who focus on, you know, either Greco-Roman history or early Judaism or specifically historical Jesus. And then the question they asked was whether, um, you know, whether, uh, how did they put it? It was whether uh, random chance, you know, is uh, or whether you know Darwinian mechanisms are sufficient to account for biological evolution. Of course, biology has moved beyond Darwin, you know, unsurprisingly to anyone except for you know the sort of science deniers. And so, people who hold mainstream views can sign this, right? If they are not aware of what the agenda is that's driving it. I mean, if you ask me, is the historicity of Jesus a legitimate? question for scholarly inquiry. Yes, of course it is, right? Does that mean my name should be on this list supporting their conclusions? I don't think so, right? I think this um, YouTube conversation indicates otherwise, right? I want to pick up on that point. Yeah. So I mentioned that in the video that Bart Ehrman in his book, Did Jesus Exist, uh, brings up the fact that he takes mythicism seriously. Uh, he's debated Robert M. Price on the subject. So you have this list of scholars that take mythicism seriously why isn't bart ehrman on the list why isn't james mcgrath on the list yeah right yeah the and thing the that's thing most about astonishing about carrier's list is that he didn't put himself first <laughs> <laughs> so, well, that's, so i i i will i will point out um uh john d john d brought this up um i i i also qualify for the list and and richard asked me specifically if he in, could include me on it and i asked him uh, not to, just on the basis of how this tends to be used as a bludgeon by his followers in in bashing people over the head with about uh, about the credibility of uh, of the current position. Well, I want to make a few. I want to make a few more points on that. Well, but I really want to say now that you know I hope oh. that he'll reconsider that we can revisit this and get ourselves added. Because having these two incompetent scholars on that list will so. undermine his credibility. And so that might be a good thing overall. Sorry. Yeah, and Bar he said Bart Ehrman's a liar, so he can have a liar on the list. So three entries on this list, Kip, are from, a same, for, are from the same uh, research article from these three theologians. And they write, the existence of Jesus as a historical person cannot be determined with any certainty and the peer-reviewed literature doubting the historicity of Jesus is emer emerging with obvious, obvious rebuttals. So that's the only thing they say in the entire research article about this. The, the name of the research article is Nature of Evidence and Religion and Natural Science. It has nothing to do with the New Testament. It has nothing to do with the historical Jesus. But because they have that throwaway line, they get three entries on Carrier's list. Three entries. And it's up to what, like 42? Wow, wow. I think so. Yeah. I, yeah. Think it's, I think it's 42 now. And then I also document in my video, he includes Burton Mack. So yeah, right. it's in a chapter from a book and in the footnotes, this is what he, this is where he gets this. I actually, in the video include the footnote and I tell people just pause the footnote or pause the video, read the footnote for yourself, compare what Burton Mack says to what carrier says that Burton Mack says, because they're not the same thing. Burton Mack is not saying that you should take mythicism seriously. He's not saying scholars should take mythicism seriously. He's merely noting that uh, G.A. Wells was on the fringes of the discipline, and he mentions it as um, he mentions him as among those in the field uh, that people in the field aren't taking seriously. But he he says it as he mentions it specifically as among things the field should be taking more note of. That's not what Max says. Just go go to my video, pause it, read a footnote for yourself, and then compare it to what Carrier says. They're not the same thing. Yeah. So and Carrier wants us to check. I checked. Yeah. And definitely, even even the things that he quotes here should make it clear that you know this is this is a, a list of people, most of whom you know, are not you know a lot of whom are not in the field, but the ones who are in the field say, you know, I mean, say things like. 
you know, we know nothing about the real man, but I think right. the early material at least suggests there was indeed a Jew called Jesus, right, from whom he suspects some few sayings originated. That's mainstream history. That's not mythicism, right? That's not going and forcing the last few details. You know, historic historians vary on lots of topics, right? And sometimes going beyond a certain point in one direction or another shows that you're either not being critical, you're just being credulous and trusting everything that the sources say, or you're being overly skeptical and are determined to cast doubt even when some of the evidence resists that conclusion. And you know, so I think yeah, I'd encourage people to look at that list. You know, check. You know, do exactly what Carrier says to do. Check. Look up what these people say. Read these people, right? I mean, if people would you know stop just reading people like Richard Carrier. Stop trusting him that every you know when he says that everybody else is uh, incompetent who disagrees with him. Read the people that he put on his list and see what they actually say. Yeah. They're probably going to come to much more balanced conclusions, and the world will be a better place for it. Yeah. So let me give one more example on the list. This one's my favorite. Number thirteen, Rodney uh, Blackhurst. So he's somebody who endorses uh, Joseph Atwell's theory. And so he writes, he has known to, oh boy. Known to, yeah, <laughs> known to endorse Joseph Atwell's crankery and some other dubious things. And I'm sitting here going, then why are you including it? <laughs> so if somebody had a PhD in ancient religion and they endorse, say, the, the Jesus mushroom theory, would they be on this list? Yikes, eh? Yeah. Yeah. So you're right. It, Maybe. It, the, the, it, they throw this around. Oh, there's 40 plus scholars that take mythicism seriously. Yeah. Is need, John Marco Allegro on his list? No, no. Uh, I wonder. I wonder if the reason why he didn't include him is because he 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 didn't actually end up getting his PhD. Sorry, it's just a just an interesting thought that I. Do we need Do we need a historical Jesus equivalent of Project Steve? Right. You know, you know what that is? Yeah, right. yes. yeah. For any viewers who may not, right, after the Discovery Institute did its descent from Darwin thing, they put together a list, you know, um, so some people put together a list. I think, was it the National Center for Science Education behind this? And yes, in honor of, you know, uh, particular Steve, uh, who, uh, you know, Stephen Jay Gould, who, famous biologist, they said, okay, we can find more people with much more relevant, you know, specifically relevant qualifications who are happen to be named Steve, right? Which is like 1% of the, the, the scholars in the field who draw the opposite conclusion. And ju just to show that these lists are actually, you know, really worthless, you know, which I think is- They kind of are, yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you expect uh, scholars to agree, if you think that we aren't going to spend our time pushing at boundaries and trying out possibilities, then you, you've misunder fundamentally misunderstood scholarship, right? Um, ideas are worth considering. The reason I don't accept mythicism is not because I don't think it's worth considering, it's because I've considered it closely, yeah. uh, because I found it intriguing and I'm not persuaded by it. So as worthless as as worthless as the as as these lists are, maybe maybe it's also worthwhile pointing out that uh, that I, I think the the um uh, the descent from Darwinism list that the Discovery Institute put out actually had over seven hundred. Mm -hmm. uh signatures on it right yeah rich has got 42 yeah um <laughs> talk about that for a moment because in the grand scheme of things when you think about ancient historians and classicists and you know biblical scholars 40 that's kind of a small number especially when you consider the fact very that small yeah that most people on this list aren't mythicists they're yeah. just people that supposedly take it to be plausible at least well, I think that's it, right? And maybe maybe the, the the better way to go about doing this, and maybe Richard will consider this, is actually putting a list out that people have the opportunity to assent to, um, which is what the uh, the Discovery Institute list is. These are people who have, have signed on and said, yes, I actually think this. Um, how many of those 42 are even go are going to go that far? To say yes, I'm putting my name on here as well, someone yeah. who you would have to eliminate you know. a few names because some of them are dead. Well, right. <laughs> 
So, um, it, but yeah, with with regards to the with regards to the field, um, you know, the uh, the Society of Biblical Literature, which is the largest, certainly not by by no means the the only um, organization uh, dedicated to biblical studies, uh, but the largest one, and they hold an annual meeting uh, every every November, the third week of November every year. Um, the numbers were were down quite a bit after uh COVID, like they were for everything but you know up for for the the several years leading up to uh 2020 you know the the sbl was drawing 10,000 12,000 scholars from all over the world to talk about nothing but uh but the bible right yeah, so if we do twelve thousand minus forty-two, that should give us about you know, what the you know the other list could hold. You know, right? So. <laughs> All right, guys. So is there anything you wanna, anything else you want to add about Carrier's blog? Any final thoughts? Um, uh, I don't think I have anything. All right. Well, I so uh, appreciate you guys both coming on here today. I got your information down in the description if people want to check you out. Uh, make sure you like, comment, and subscribe. Uh, I'm actually about to do an interview with James, another interview. Uh, we're going to be talking about his new book, which I have that linked in the description as well. <laughs> Very nice. So is there anything else you want to plug? Uh, are, are you talking to Are you talking to me? Either one. <laughs> or, or James? Oh, um, so uh, I, I have a couple things. Um, okay. I think I have a couple of things. I'm going to be on the Freed Thinker podcast next week on Friday, uh, talking about um, uh, violence in the Old Testament and Christian apologetics. And um, I just I just published a video uh, yesterday on um, uh, the Book of Daniel and the evidence from the Dead Sea Scrolls. So if you haven't watched it already, you should check it out. That's part of my ongoing series on uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls, which people should check out. And I do have, uh, I have another one that's upcoming. Uh, it's finished. It's available on my Patreon and I'll be, I'll be releasing it probably in the next couple of weeks, but it's, it's very, very special because it's all about uh, Star Wars canon and the Dead Sea Scrolls. And it features a special surprise guest. Um, but uh, yeah, so there's some exciting things happening with. Uh, with yeah, and channel. I have your YouTube channel linked in the description if people want to check out your YouTube channel. Uh, James, anything else you want to plug? No, thanks for thanks for mentioning the book. And you know, as as a Star Wars fan, I'll just say you know check out Kip's thing. Oh, thanks. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, I, I appreciate it so much. Uh, one last question: uh, Do you guys check? Sorry, I I missed it. Do we what? Do you check? Do you check? Uh, I try to. I, <laughs> I, I, I try to double check everything. All right. Thanks, guys. I appreciate it. Have Thank a good you. day. All right.